Nine-year-old King Josiah bolted down the lamp-lit corridors of the palace with his nurse in hot pursuit. Every few seconds, he cast a glance over his shoulder at the portly woman's flushed cheeks and furrowed brow as she waddled along behind him and he dissolved into giggles. He skidded through a doorway and then bounded up the stairs two at a time, leaving the sound of the nurse's labored breath far below. Breathless with laughter, he shot toward the doorway leading to the next corridor, just as Hilkiah, the priest, his faithful tutor, stepped out in front of him to block his path. Time for bed, I think, Hilkiah said with a small smile. Come, I will tell you a story. The frustrated nurse reached Josiah's chambers just behind the tutor and his royal charge. For a moment, she stood gasping for breath, glaring at the young king. Hilkiah smiled and dismissed her with a small wave as Josiah jumped into bed. Tell me the story about when God parted the sea, he begged. Yes, the sea, Hilkiah said, as he patted the bed and reached for the blanket at the end. Reluctantly, Josiah lay down at last as his tutor pulled the blanket up beneath the boy's chin. And don't forget the part about Pharaoh, Josiah said. Hilkiah reached up to gently smooth the boy king's curls. The child was so close to the age of his own son, yet so much was at stake in his reign. What kind of king would he be? Would he follow after God like his great-grandfather Hezekiah, or would he follow after false gods like his grandfather and father? And so Hilkiah gave Josiah the best chance he could. He told him stories. This night he told King Josiah the story of how the creator of the universe loved Israel, and of how, when her cries reached his ears from her Egyptian bondage, he forced Pharaoh to let his people go. He told Josiah of how God held back the walls of the sea so that his people could cross safely, and then let the water rush back when Pharaoh and his chariots followed in pursuit. The child's eyes grew heavy and then closed, the rhythmic rise and fall of his chest signaling that one more day in the shaping of the young king's heart had come to a close. Hilkiah rose, took the oil lamp from its stand, and moved silently to the door where armed guards stood ready to protect the boy. Hilkiah paused for a moment, turned, and whispered the ancient prayer over the child and all of Judah. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Twenty-six-year-old King Josiah sat on a gilded throne inlaid with ivory. For ten years he had reigned over Judah independently, finally old enough to rule apart from his trusted advisors. For the past six years he had begun working to reform many of the idolatrous practices promoted by his father and grandfather. Finally, he had enough funds to begin a much-needed restoration of the temple. Now he eagerly awaited an update on the efforts from his trusted secretary, Shaphan. The distinguished official swept into the room carrying a large scroll and bowed low before the king. Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the workers and supervisors at the temple, Shaphan said. King Josiah smiled and nodded. The work on the temple could begin at last. Also, Shaphan said, while cleaning at the temple, Hilkiah the priest found something that seems to be important. It is a book. Josiah sat on the edge of his throne in expectation. Please read it to me, he said. Shaphan unrolled the parchment, revealing line after line of neat script on the yellowing pages, and began to read from the book of the law given by Moses. The words of the Lord fell like blows, one after another, from Shaphan's lips as he read. Josiah grew pale and gripped the arms of his throne until knuckles turned white. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Shaphan read on and on as the afternoon shadows grew long on the palace floors. When the last lines of the law were read, the secretary bowed his head low in horror. The king fell to his knees, grasped the top of his tunic with both hands, and ripped it in two in mourning for his people's grave sins. Sites of pagan worship dotted Judah's landscape. Asherah poles littered every high hill. Fires burned to Molech, Topheth, and Shemash in the valleys where the ceremonial drums roared and fragile infants wailed in torment. Even the temple of the Lord had been defiled with articles of idolatrous worship. An Asherah pole stood in its sanctuary, and shelters for shrine prostitutes were clustered outside its walls. Go and take Hilkiah, Akikam, Akbor, and Isaiah with you, said the king. Go and inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us, because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. 
The King's delegation wove through the narrow streets of the market district, past baskets filled with jade green olives, tethered lambs, jars of oil, and stacks of clay pots. Pigeon cooed softly in their cages as silver clinked and merchants haggled over prices. When the men reached the door of the royal tailor, they ducked inside. The wizened old man looked up from his delicate work on a priestly robe and then pointed one gnarled finger to the back of the shop where his wife, the prophetess Hulda, was waiting for them. One after another, the men ducked into the small back room where bolts of bright cloth hung from racks on the ceiling. The space was tight and the air suffocating. In the corner, a tiny woman sat on a low stool, her gray braid peeking out from beneath her head covering. She carefully placed the needlework on which she was working onto her lap and turned tear-filled eyes to the men crowded in her doorway. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Tell the man who sent you to me, she said. This is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on this place and its people, according to everything written in the book the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and aroused my anger by all the idols in their hands have made, my anger will burn against this place and it will not be quenched. She paused, lifted a cup of water to her lips, and when she continued, her voice was soft. Tell the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the words you have heard. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against this place and its people, that they would become a curse and be laid waste, and because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore I will gather you to your ancestors, and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I am going to bring on this place. King Josiah sent messengers to summon all the elders of Judah to come to him. Then, in a somber procession, he led them up to the once beautiful temple Solomon had built for the God of Israel. Josiah stood next to one of the bronze pillars at the entrance of the temple and turned to Hilkiah the priest, who handed him the scroll. Carefully, the king unrolled the scroll and read the word of God to the elders. When he was finished, he dedicated himself and his rule to the covenant of the Lord, promising to keep God's commands. After the elders also dedicated themselves to keep the covenant of the Lord, Josiah returned the scroll to Hilkiah the priest. He stood for a moment surveying the temple defiled with idols and nearby quarters of the male shrine prostitutes as his jaw clenched in fury. Cleanse the temple, he said to Hilkiah. Remove every idol and every item used in worship of Baal and Asherah and destroy them. Josiah burned everything associated with idolatrous worship and scattered the ashes. He tore down the shelters of the shrine prostitutes and drove the priests of Baal from the temple. Then methodically he moved from one side of idolatrous worship throughout Judah to the next, cleansing his land. One morning he and his soldiers climbed the Mount of Olives to stand before a shrine to Chemosh, the destroyer that had held dominion over the hillside since the time of Solomon. Josiah stood before the fish god, its stony arms outstretched to receive its sacrifices. The base of the statue was black with ashes of a thousand fires. The anguished cries of countless children seemed to haunt the place, lingering in the soft rustling of the silvery olive leaves. With a nod from the king, his men moved in. They tied a heavy rope around the base of the statue. The other end was tethered to an ox. The driver of the ox cried out, and the beast moved forward. And with a groan, Chemosh crashed to the ground. When the land was finally cleansed from idolatry, King Josiah called his people together to celebrate Passover. They roasted spotless lambs and ate bitter herbs with unleavened bread as the priests told the sweet story, their story, once again. They told the story of how the God of the universe had loved Israel and had chosen to make them a people of his very own, how he blessed their father Abraham so that all the nations of all the earth might be blessed through him. They told of their ancestors' cruel bondage in Egypt and how God forced Pharaoh to let his people go. They told the story of how God held back the walls of the sea so his people could cross on dry land, and how God led his people home just as he promised. Compassionate Father, my heart sings with joy as I remember the stories of your deliverance of Israel. Forever you remained faithful to your promises to Abraham. Even when your people strayed far from your purposes, you mercifully preserved a remnant. May this Advent season remind me of the hope I have in you, that though my way at times may seem long and dark, your redemption is as sure as the promise of the dawn. Rise in my heart anew, root and offspring of David. Shine forever bright in my darkness, beautiful morning star. Amen.